August 1945, two nuclear bombs were dropped on Japan by American planes. Over 100,000 people died. How real is the threat of nuclear war today? We'll be checking out a government pamphlet which gives instructions on how to protect yourself if a nuclear attack were to happen, and some handy hints on how to turn your home into a nuclear fallout shelter. And what if Teesside was the target for a nuclear bomb, or Sunderland, or Tyneside? We visit Durham Control of the Royal Observer Corps, who are preparing for the worst. Terrible pictures there of the only time that nuclear weapons have been used for real against ordinary people, against the Japanese of Hiroshima and Nagasaki 35 years ago. But those images aren't just history. It's possible that they could be part of our future. America, Russia, China, the giant powers, and a worrying number of smaller powers are busy getting together bigger, better and more devastating nuclear weapons. Britain's in there, of course, with the expected announcement that we'll be modernising our defence system with American Trident missiles and providing bases for long-range cruise missiles. Does all this make us a force to be reckoned with or a prime target? It's reckoned that the arms race is justified because all this nasty nuclear hardware hides behind the magic word, deterrent, which makes it respectable. It's supposed to work like this. If we've got the bomb, you won't dare attack us. If you've got the bomb, we won't dare attack you. But a growing number of people in the campaign for nuclear disarmament are pointing out that if no one's got the bomb, no one will be attacking anybody. But they could be wrong, I suppose. If there was a nuclear war, what horrors could we expect? Well, imagine a one megaton bomb hitting Tyneside as a ground burst, and the same size bomb on Teesside exploding as an air burst. On Tyneside, everyone in a mile radius of the blast would be killed, and there would be heavy damage for up to two and a half mile radius. Glass and tiles would be shattered up to a ten mile radius around, and there would be heavy casualties from shock waves and heat blasts. On Teesside, the airburst bomb would completely wipe out a radius of one and three quarter miles below the blast, cause heavy damage for nearly three miles around, and shatter glass for eleven miles. The main difference between ground and air bursts is that ground bursts suck up dust and contaminate it. Then it comes down as deadly radioactive fallout. And that's just from one megaton bomb. We went along to the Royal Observer Corps post in Durham, where these kind of facts are part of the job to the volunteers on standby to monitor the northeast region under nuclear attack. The site in Durham was chosen because Durham isn't an industrial area and the town's not likely to be a prime target for a nuclear attack. It's been reinforced to have a blast rating of 1,000. An ordinary house has one of 25, so that it could survive as a centre for operations during a nuclear attack on the region. The centre is manned by volunteers, who have practice sessions three nights a week. They use this time to simulate the kind of procedures they would be involved in if a nuclear bomb fell anywhere in the northeast. This base is one of 25 controls in the United Kingdom, part of the UK Warning and Monitoring Organisation. And its job is to pull together information on damage and fallout risks from 40 monitoring stations from the borders down to North Yorkshire. Their work is based on the idea that a nuclear attack would leave many areas undamaged. Panic, chaos and risks from fallout would be the main dangers. The operation at this level is led by Group Controller Roy Phillips. The uh, United Kingdom Warning and Monitoring Organisation is concerned with uh, giving a warning to the public of impending air attack and then uh, keeping track of the movement of fallout. This group control acts as a centre for collecting data, processing it and redisseminating it to our customers. 
As well as receiving information from all over the region and red alert warnings if an attack is about to happen or has already happened, the centre acts as a monitoring station too. Each station can plot a nuclear explosion size and position using a ground zero indicator. That's four pinhole cameras which register the blast on an emulsion sheet. Durham has its own cameras on the roof and collecting information from these is one of the practice exercises. It could mean that someone who drew the short straw would have to go out risking fallout to pick up the information. He'd have to wear protective clothing and carry out the exercise as far as possible, passing through the airtight door in the decontamination chamber. Speed is essential too, because the information about the location of the blast must be logged as soon as possible, with data from the other stations to give a full picture of the attack. The simulated blast shown on the Durham emulsion sheet is plotted and fed into the system. The plotters working the display boards are constantly updating incoming information by radio and telephone. The boards are evolved every five minutes to keep everyone up to date. Another regular check would be made on fallout levels in Durham itself. The probe is on the roof, and so that it can be monitored even when radiation levels are at the highest, it can be pulled down inside the building and checked without anyone going out. Meanwhile, there's a map that brings the meaning of this pretend exercise really home to you, with bomb bursts being plotted for real all over the region, and fallout risks depending on wind direction and speed. One of the good things about radiation, if you can say that, is that it tails off after the first couple of days and the station would plot the lessening danger so that the all clear could be given to the local population hiding in their homes. The volunteers here have two jobs really, to feed information to other government centres and to keep the region informed of its danger areas. But how do the volunteers feel about their privileged position in the station, knowing that their families are outside? This is a decision that all the volunteers have had to face, but uh, they realize that a job has to be done, and each in their own way have uh, satisfied themselves that their family would be able to cope in their absence. What would you do if there was a nuclear bomb dropped in Britain? Scream. <laughs> no. Um... It's not a lot we could do, really, is there? Probably go underground. What do you think most people would do? Die. Probably they'll get down a drain out the road. What do you think most people would try to do? Panic. I couldn't care less. I'll tell you now. Because if there was a new attack on Britain, we'd all finish. I would make for the nearest shelter in the bottom of our garden, I think. Should there be one, you've got a sort of build your protection up, uh, sort of block your windows up and all this sort of thing to try and prevent the radiation getting in. What would you do in the event of a nuclear explosion? Go outside and welcome it and say I've had uh, getting on for 62 years of fun. Uh, let's end it all. <laughs> There's a Germany where they have to build a new... Every new house has to have a bomb shelter, right? And uh, I think everybody, I, you know, personally, myself, I just said, you know, screw you and sit back and relax and just enjoy a cigarette or something like that. And uh, just let them get on with it. I don't think it's a question of paying for the nuclear explosion. I think it's more a question of stopping people trying to have them. Do you think that most people are prepared for a nuclear attack over no, here? No, I think they're burying their heads in the sand. Because uh, the world that's going to be left is not going to be worth living in, is it? You know what I mean? Britain's preparations for nuclear war have been criticised as being pathetically inadequate. There are no public shelters, people aren't aware of the need for protection, and it's easy to imagine the scenes of panic and chaos if the bomb dropped. This pamphlet would be given to every household if war threatened, with hints on turning your home into a shelter. It's called Protect and Survive, but would it really help? Well, it's been claimed that 80% of the North East population could survive an attack if they used the advice in this pamphlet. It tells you to turn your house into a fireproof shelter to protect yourself from the radioactive fallout which can kill you by attacking your body cells. If fallout affects your home, it could last for 14 days. 
so you've got to stay inside a reinforced room till the all clear sounds. The idea is to choose a room in the middle of your home, a room with as little outside wall as possible, and then reinforce the walls. You do this by using bags of earth from the garden or drawers and suitcases filled with solid material. The room should contain an inner refuge too. You can build it from doors, reinforced in the same way, where you can hold up during the worst of the radiation, maybe for two days. Obviously, if you take an average family of, say, four people, you need to be well prepared for 14 days. The pamphlet lists the survival kit you're going to need, like 15 gallons of water. That's about two pints per person per day. Enough tinned and dried food for 14 days. That's quite a shopping list, isn't it? A radio and lots of spare batteries, because that's your only contact with the outside world to keep in touch with news of attacks and government broadcasts. And a mechanical clock and calendar so that you can keep track of the days and nights. Hygiene in a small space like this is going to be vital, so a plastic dustbin and bags for rubbish are on the list as well. And a suggestion for a homemade chemical toilet, a chair without a seat and a plastic lined bucket. Water supply is very important, so they suggest you wash up plates with a box of sand and paper tissues. Yuck. Then you're going to need all this camping gear here. Plenty of sleeping bags, blankets, warm clothes, saucepans, plates, etc. And, of course, a first aid kit. And if the first aid kit doesn't work, the pamphlet even tells you how to dispose of and label any dead bodies. Oh, what a horrible thought. Well, apparently these instruction books would be issued free during a time of political tension, giving everyone time to get ready. But looking at the kind of work involved to reinforce your shelter, I mean, it's estimated about a tonne of earth would be have to be dug from your garden. Is it practical? What if you haven't got a garden, if you live in a flat? What if a war starts with very little warning? And are there enough supplies? Countries like Sweden, Switzerland and Russia already have plans for the evacuation of their population. Mass shelters have been built and houses have their own custom-built shelters. It makes this kind of preparation look a bit like Toy Town, doesn't it? It certainly does, Chris. In fact, there is growing pressure from some groups of MPs for a full inquiry into the state of Britain's readiness to face nuclear war, and the Home Secretary is going to report on it. But with mass shelters estimated to cost up to five million, sorry, five thousand pounds per head of the population, can Britain afford them? It looks like it's going to be a case of do it yourself or die. And on that sobering thought, we leave you with the personal comment on nuclear war from Kate Bush, with a song called Breathing. And let's hope we can all find some clean, radiation-free air left in a few years' time. See you next week. With a bit of luck.